Hey there, stackers. We're getting ready to press play on today's episode. But before we do that, I just want to give you a little heads up. I, of course, listen to a ton of podcasts myself, and I like good audio. And I have to tell you that the solution that we've been using lately to try to get good audio, especially from uh, my dad, Shortwave, it has this weird ducking feature. Sadly, we usually run two recorders at the same time, just to show you a little bit about how the sausage is made. This time, we weren't able to do that for just a variety of reasons. So you're going to hear me kind of duck out a few times here, but (laughs) it's such a fun, fun episode. We got in a circle, mom, OG, Doug, I, and said, you know what? We've got to put this out because we've got the Chelsea Brennan with us today. Yes, the Chelsea Brennan and the stuff we talk about is fantastic. So I'm going to apologize for some of the beginnings of my sentences. And uh, we have taken that solution to the curb and it is going out with the trash. So back to our usual sound quality next episode. Before today, the entertaining but orally imperfect Friday episode. Hey, this is Pete the Planner, USA Today money columnist and host of the Ask Pete the Planner podcast. When I'm not fixing the weirdest financial situations you've ever heard of, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're celebrating my favorite holiday, Friday. We're breaking out the red wine stained carpet today because coming back for a return visit to the basement is our favorite trivia contestant, the chief smart money mama at smartmoneymamas.com, the Chelsea Brennan. And from our very own podcast, it's OG. Plus from lenpenzo.com, it's Spider-Man. Nah, he's busy blowing up a movie theater box office somewhere. Now today it's just Len Penzo. (laughs) We're all about the big figures today because in our main headline, one guy racked up $16,000 in credit debt and then paid it all off. Plus, in our Friday FinTech segment, we'll talk to David Nelson from Bumped. That's not all. We'll break out the magnifying glass and answer a voicemail from Tyson who wants to know When's the right point in life to hire a financial advisor? And of course, we'll still make time for my Chelsea Brennan Enriched Trivia. And now, a guy who's probably already a dollar over, Joe Salcihai. That's the story of my life. One dollar over. But not today. Today we are rocking and rolling because we've got a great crew with us. I am Joe Salci. Hi, average Joe Money on Twitter. And with me across the card table for another day, it's my friend OG. Quiet, I'm texting. And you're the only person here that can't see. We have actually the video on our uh, on my dead shortwave today, and you can't see it. But I can because I see a reflection of the reflection. You do see a reflection. In the reflection. Everyone is backwards. <laughs> Which which makes no difference because he's also six feet underground, I believe. I can look right into the bunker right now. It's Mr. Len Penzo. That's 60 feet, Joe. 60 feet. Is that how far it's? You would know these statistics. The nuclear bomb blast is going to end it all for everybody else. 60 feet under is enough to save you? Uh, only if you have uh, high pressure uh, concrete, pressure tolerant concrete. Otherwise, no. None of us are going to make it. So why I'm not worried about nukes. I'm worried about the zombie apocalypse. Ah, gotcha. That's a fun topic at parties. Like, what do people say when you say that at a party? Oh, that's so interesting. Hey, listen, I got to go refill my drink. I'll be, I'll be right back. Yeah, I'm a part. It's a, it's a mood killer. My husband I'm, would tell you you need a boat because zombies can't swim. So you might as well be out in the middle of the ocean. There, there it is. <laughs> you just, just go to the Bahamas. Or go to where that, <laughs> not only can the cool people not reach that fire festival, but zombies can't either. <laughs> and that, by the way, is the voice of the smartest money mama and smart money mamas, our good friend Chelsea Brennan. She's back. Glad to be back in the basement. 
Do you like <laughs> that we change your name into a verb? <laughs> You know, not exactly what I was hoping to be known for, but it's it's perfect. You should try a bag on your head. <laughs> that really that really sticks also. You're like, hey, I think we should take this off for the next marketing picture. No, no, this is what everyone's know knows you for. It's like I really don't You'll ruin everything like, if you take the like bag we're off. Advancing the cause. It's so good. But you know what does advance the cause, OG? Uh Shoot, I'm going to walk right into it. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. What when advances the cost? When people go to stackybenjamins.com <laughs> forward slash stacker, sign up for our stacker where nearly every week you get not only great money tips, but you also find all the stuff going in the basement. The fact that Here, uh, nearly every week, nearly you know, we, we've modified that. <laughs> we should just have every week asterisk. Yes. <laughs> Except when we can't. Except the weeks that are off. Yes. But most weeks you'll receive a Some missive weeks. from the basement. Actually, last week's was good. Thank you very much. It includes, by the way, not just the good stuff that went out last week. It also includes, by the way, we, we've got uh, stuff happening in Detroit. We're going to be traveling again this fall. So uh, stay up to date with what's going on here. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash stacker. By the way, I forgot to ask her because she's been here. Chelsea, is this your fourth time here or third? Fourth. Fourth. That's right. Because we did an interview of somebody that you interviewed. We had a joint interview. Uh, that, that makes sense. We did an interview of your interview. <laughs> We did. Because that's us. We don't create original content here. We just borrow other people's stuff. Repurposed. Right. But it was actually the daughter of a super listener of Stacking Benjamins, which I think is how we ended up interviewing her. It's her mom messaged you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and it was great. It was fantastic. But anyway, for it people was. that don't know about Smart Body Mamas, because I think everybody does, I just assume they do, <laughs> tell everybody what you do there. So we are a place to for moms to talk about money, a safe place, no shame, no judgment. Um, whether you're really learning from the beginning or you're pursuing uh, financial independence, we, we cover it all. We will link to that in our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. But that's later. You can go there. Right now we got Chelsea. We got Len. We got OG. So why don't we talk about getting out of debt and get your financial house in order? Let's do that now. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Our headline today comes to us from a market watch. This is written by Nicole Lynn uh, Pesci. Do you think it's Pesci? P-E-S-C-E? Yes. Nicole Lynn. Isn't, isn't <laughs> That's a that reasonable that? attempt. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah, I think I followed that one off. But this guy wrapped up $16,000 in credit card debt seven ways he found financial freedom. Nicole writes, you can dig yourself out of debt. A man in his late 20s recently revealed on Reddit that he racked up 16000 in credit card debt in four years after one undisclosed medical emergency, getting married and having a baby, and what he calls slow spending piled on the card. He signed up for the card when he was just 23. At his lowest point, he was virtually cleaned out. Quote, I actually saved my very last dollar and have it taped to my steering column in my truck, he wrote. And when I say last dollar... I truly mean it. We had negative balance in the bank and overtaxed all our cards. But he and his wife were able to wipe out their credit card debt and save up another 16000 in under two years. He shared 11 pieces of financial wisdom he wished people had told him before he got so deep in debt as uh, such. Number one, pay it off later is a no-no. Later never comes. Let's talk about that. Did you guys mess up with money at all when you were young, Len? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 no, I didn't. I, you know what? I don't know what it was, but uh, it's just I was always, always it, just the thought of paying interest to anybody. It just, I don't know. It just rubbed me the wrong way from day one. So um, I, I was fortunate enough to never, ever uh, have to do that. Chelsea, how about you? No, I've always been a compulsive saver and have a very hard time parting with any money. So <laughs> we did not have that problem. Is your husband like that? No, but he is a natural security seeker. So he likes to spend money, but he also is panicked. You know, he likes the zombie apocalypse, you know, scenarios like Len. So, you know, <laughs> I, I could get him on board with saving was a good idea. So, oh, gee, I guess that leaves you with I. I've made more mistakes than all these people put together twice. It's interesting. I like this fact, though. And I guess I guess my question to you, OG, is, well, not even my question, just the, the point. You can recover. Like if you're somebody listening, this guy not only is proof, but for anybody listening who's here because they want to get their act together, you can recover. Well, I think it's important to also recognize that what is your current malaise 
is somebody else's 10th step on the ladder. You know, if you're at 16,000 and you're going, oh my gosh, I could never get out of this. This is impossible. Like it'll take me 20,000 centuries to get out of this. There's somebody else going, yeah, dude, I got 300,000 of student loans. Like I would love to have 16,000 of debt. Right. You know, that sucks too. And there's people out there that have $800,000 mortgages and they're going, I would love to have 300,000 in debt, not 800,000 on my mortgage and so on and so forth. It's not a badge of honor by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, the first point is just recognizing, just being okay with being done with it. Like just going, I'm at the point where I don't care what has to happen, but I am not doing this anymore. End of discussion. Whatever got me into this situation, it is what it is, but I am over it. <laughs> yeah. I remember that point where I just had to say, I'm, I, yeah. I, I just can't live this way anymore. I'm yeah. done. Done. In fact, it says in here, to your point, their struggle shared by more than half, 55% of American households carrying credit card debt with one in 10 people carrying a balance higher than $5,000, according to a recent CNBC report, U.S. credit card debt hit a record $870 billion by the end of 2018, according to Federal Reserve, with almost 480 million credit cards in circulation. The game plan to get out of debt is neither quick nor easy. It starts with monitoring your finances, making a budget, and sticking to it, says Ben Sacadato. <laughs> Swung and miss on that one too. A New Just York, a bit outside. A New York Bay certified financial planner. Is that is that really where it starts, Chelsea? Do you think it starts with monitoring your finances, making a budget, and sticking to it? Yeah, I think having a sense of where your money's going is a key. And I actually really liked the Redditor post's idea of the slow creep, right? Like you don't if you don't know where your money's going, it's like a hundred dollars this month is over. Okay, my credit card balance is not too high. Two hundred dollars the next month, and it just kind of builds, right? It sneaks up on you unless you're really tracking where it's going. Yeah, it's not that big stuff that kills you, you're saying. It's uh, that accumulation of a bunch of little things. I think for the average household, right, who thinks, okay, we're pretty good with money. We're not completely ignoring it. It's just that you wake up three, four, five years in after you've had a kid, after you've had some medical expenses, and it's like, crap, now we're $16,000 in credit card debt. Um, we thought we were doing okay. Yeah, I found that same thing, Len, when I first got into credit card debt. It's like, life is going along. I'm slowly overspending. And then the bad stuff happened, and I had I had nowhere to go. Have you always had a, an emergency fund from the beginning to make sure that, that that happens? How did you stay away from debt? Well, one is just, I, it was natural. I didn't, I, I like I said, I, I abhor it. So it's like, I, I it was like, I, I avoided it like the plague. But, you know, it helps. Like, let's go back to the point. It, it really helps when you know what your income is and what your outgo is. I mean, if you don't see that, if you don't have that visual, it is so easy to to lose track of how much you're spending and where it's all going. So, I mean, that is absolutely critical for everybody to that you've got to know what's coming in and you've got to know what's going out. And before you know that, if you don't know that, you can't control the problem and fix it. But I'm still wondering if that's actually where it starts, because I I hear what you're saying that you absolutely abhor it. I hear Chelsea say that she's a natural saver that doesn't spend a penny. <laughs> I I hear I hear OG say that you got to turn it around and live a second way. Don't you think it starts instead of this idea with like, I read this stuff as a guy that was in big time debt, that it starts with getting your finances in order. And I think, no, it does. It's got to start emotionally. Like, doesn't it start with Len, the fact that you hate credit cards, you hate paying out money to somebody else. Yeah. Well, well, okay. If you want to get that far back and into the emotional part. Yeah. I mean, that gave me a huge advantage over somebody who, I'll use my son, for example, who's, who every time he gets a dollar, he spent, he can't spend it fast enough. And I worry about him for that. He's at a huge disadvantage. He's the total opposite of me. And, and it scares me. And the only way he's ever going to get a hold of that, what do you call it, that uh, predilection to spend is he's got to see it. He's got to see it on paper or on an Excel spreadsheet or something. He's got to see the, the problem that's going to accrue if he continues spending more than he earns. Is that where it is, OG, the mirror? I see where you're going with this. And I think that it has to be that you hate the other thing, which might be, you know, debt or the current situation more than you hate not having the other stuff, whatever that is. Like you have to get to the tipping point because people don't willingly go, I'm going to go spend 20 grand more than I make and assume that that doesn't have any repercussions. I think people understand. I mean, you just, you just kind of intuitively go, well, eventually this, the chicken comes home to roost on this. 
but then that manifests itself in payments or like you said, now you're overextended and then something really bad does happen and you don't have any place to go. You don't have a reserve or even the availability to, to borrow or that emergency or whatever it is. So it has to get to that breaking point, I think, emotionally where you say that's it. Like, it's just such a visceral, like, okay, I don't care what happens. I'm just not living this way anymore. And then going to the data and going, okay, now what, what can I do with this stuff that I have? Can I make more money? Can I spend less in different areas? Can I restructure the debt? You know, Tony Robbins says that you get better outcomes if you ask yourself better questions. And a lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, you know, why, why did this happen to me? And I just, you know, just kind of a woe is me type of thing. But we all get better decisions from ourselves when we ask, okay, the facts of the case are this. How am I going to make different choices moving forward? And once you do that, when you combine the information with the emotional component of it, um, really is the is the best outcome, I think. Yeah, because emotionally, Chelsea, how do you and your husband avoid like the trip that maybe you can't afford today? I mean, because everybody has these feelings, right? You're like, I've been doing so well. I deserve it. Number one on this list is I'll pay it off later. Yeah. So for us, you know, right now we have toddlers, so it is not enjoyable to go anywhere. It's like you're not going on vacation. You're just like going on a trip. Just have kids <laughs> and you'll not go anywhere. I'm just saying like in the past. We, we, Financial planning 101. <laughs> exactly. Way easier to save money when you have kids. Um, <laughs> so we had our like annual trip that we saved for and like we just naturally don't have super high like lifestyle desires. I'm a homebody. Uh, we have chickens and we can't, we don't just, we just don't travel a lot. So that was, that's it for us. But to go back to like settling your emotional side and Len's comment about his son and like seeing it in black and white, I don't think that's the first step for everybody. I think if you're naturally numbers inclined, black and white helps. But like my brother who has been, we've been making budgets with him since he like got his first allowance at 10 is still could have $20 in the bank and be like, this $200 dinner feels very reasonable to me. You're delicious dinners. <laughs> and those are the words he used. He's like, this is a reasonable price. I'm like, well, it is if you have money, but you, you know, you don't. And it wasn't until he had like a wake up call of like, hey, I can't keep playing hockey professionally uh, or semi-professionally if I don't get my act together. Um, and it's like that you need that wake up call. And like for this guy on Reddit, it was like he had a kid, he had responsibilities and he found that bottom before he figured his, his stuff out. Uh, I think for some people, that's got to be the starting point of what's my motivation. Did your brother ever find the bottom? He didn't find the bottom, but he it was very clear to him that he was not going to be floated anymore through the off season. So in hockey, you only get paid during the season and then you have five months off in the summer. So he used to like move back with my parents and like not work and just train. And he had to, you know, he had to step it up a little bit. He had to finally figure out how to cover that five months. Exactly. He had, he had to develop a little bit like a squirrel, you know, <laughs> isn't that the old, uh, old thing? The squirrel saving up for the winter, except he was saving up for the summer. <laughs> being hockey i don't know but number swing and a miss but <laughs> number one you won't pay it off later number two side hustles can help a lot len you and i have talked about this for years side hustles are are the key earn more don't click coupons earn more money yeah because saving coupons trying to save money will never make you rich i mean there's a, there's diminishing returns there so yes the clear way out of this is to earn extra income and there are lots and lots of ways to earn extra income even from home is there a downside chelsea in in going the side hustle route when you're trying to pay off debt i think you have to take into account the long-term ability to keep doing this work right if you're completely running yourself ragged and you have kids and you're already working 60 hours a week and you're trying to tack on another thing you don't want to burn out before you're actually done with the process because then you're going to just blow money again. I think it's like playing into what can you actually handle and what's st stable long term. Yeah, you and I did that like seven years ago. OG, we're like, we'll start a podcast. What could possibly go wrong? Tons of money. Pennies <laughs> from heaven. Burned out in week four and we're still going. What the heck's up with that? I also worry, Chelsea, though. I worry about having more money, if you don't have any financial controls and you're doing the side hustle thing, you just think, well, heck, I earned another 60. I'm only going to spend another 30. So you spend the extra 30, but then you have to Uber to the place where you spend the 30 bucks. There goes another 10. You forgot to calculate the tax on it on the 30 bucks. There's another four, five, six, whatever dollars. And pretty soon the 60 bucks is all gone. Bye-bye. 
Yeah, you got to set the purpose ahead of time, right? Like this money is going to specifically to this thing. Uh, and that's why it's worth my time to take on this extra job. Otherwise, it's not gonna be worth it. Who's done the third one on here? The third one is you'll spend what you have. So start by writing down and calculating every single one of your monthly expenses. I've, I've seen this in a lot of places, like for a few months, write down physically, not on mint. Don't use tracking. Just make it so you have to write down any, everything. Has anybody done that before? Wow. Written down every single thing, every, every single, single item. So like if I bought a gumball and a gumball machine, that's I'd, I'd put I'd write that down. I'm, I'm going over board. But. And there's some people wondering what a gumball machine is here. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's back when people used to shop for their groceries instead of have Instacart bring it to their door, Len. Can you buy gumballs from Instacart now? <laughs> from Uber Eats. I'm sure. <laughs> it's a five dollar delivery fee though. Right <laughs> on, a, on a ten cent gumball. I did this for two months when I was in big financial trouble. I wrote down every single penny. And I have to say, Len, when you have to write down the gumball, the little things. <laughs> what a pain. Yeah, it makes you not want to spend. <laughs> you don't want to put the dollar fifty in your in the Coke machine because you're like, it takes me two minutes to write down dollar fifty Coke. Screw it. I'll just keep it in my pocket. Well, and the other thing is, too, I don't want to have to write it down because I'm writing it down. I'm like, what a dumbass purchase this is, you know, and when you. <laughs> When you give yourself just a second to have to look at it for a couple months, like if you're in, in big trouble, that was incredibly helpful. I think this is also where the cash component comes in. You know, when you get kind of behind the eight ball a little bit, pardon the expression, Len, the, <laughs> uh, you know, the impact of going to the bank and like pulling out money, not tens and twenties, because that stuff spends like cotton candy. I'm talking about like big bills, like hundreds and thousand dollar bills which the bank does not ever have any of them, which I'm really ticked That's a off bummer. about. <laughs> it one time existed, I think. But anyways, you look in your wallet and you got like 300s in there and that's your all your money for the entire week. You're just not going to break that for an Egg McMuffin. Eight ball, does OG have 300s in his wallet right now? Now is not the right time to tell you. There you go. <laughs> Privacy, yo. But I just did this. I was at the I was at a meat market buying some steaks, and I didn't want to do it. I was like, "Oh crap! Now I'm going to have to break the hundred. It just it just has a weird reaction." Yeah, carrying cash works. I mean, it it, it really works. Len, do you usually stick to cash? You know, I do. I do a mixture of both. But his is more ones. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the opposite cash. I have no, I can't track it. It just disappears. Like I'll spend the cash, but if it's a credit card and I got to log it in YNAB the next day or the next week, whenever I update the budget, like that stresses me out. So cash, we, we can't keep cash around. That's funny. You say that Chelsea, cause I'm the same way cash in my wallet. I figured out was my biggest problem and not having cash was huge. Cause I hate taking the plastic out. I don't know what the deal is, mm. but I can't stand taking the plastic out. It drives me crazy every time where cash 20 bucks in my wallet is can, gone. That's what I mean. I can burn through 20 bucks pretty easily, but I can't, I'll, I'll, I'll keep a hundred dollar bill in my wallet for four months. Yeah. yeah I'm with OG. I'm the same. I would prefer to keep the money in my wallet, but studies show more people are like you two though, where cash spends slower, but Chelsea, I guess the point here is know you, right? I mean, for you and I being the complete opposite, you got to know yourself. I like uh, just a random point here. I like that Market Watch really cleaned up this Reddit guy's post because his number three is the Joneses can suck it. <laughs> <laughs> we should have gone to that one instead. <laughs> hey, Joneses. Uh, next one. What's what, what's number four? Oh, number four is beware of eBay and Amazon. This one, this one for couch shoppers is is horrible you and the honeybee len all about ebay or amazon yeah it's terrible oh my god i can spend so much on ebay and amazon i mean amazon is addictive as i whatever you want it's on amazon anything and yeah i'm spending there i spend so much money on amazon that it, it isn't even funny because it's easy hey one click purchase i don't even have to check out one click and it's done i mean it's like there's no consequence until the bill comes but it's so easy can you believe that they were able to get a patent on that? Is my under my understanding is they have a patent on that, so nobody else can do one click ordering. I read that in their book, The Everything Store. By the way, if you're wondering where I got that from, but it was it was amazing. They were even surprised. They went to apply for it, and at the time, I think the people in the patent office didn't understand what they were patenting. 
Wow. They're patenting the fact that you could do that on Amazon and nowhere else. And I guess that they own it. Maybe they don't own it anymore, but at one time, one time they did. Does they ever use eBay anymore though? I, I've, I do. Do you? Uh-huh. I was on eBay just today for the first time in ages. And I was like, what the heck am I doing here? Move, move back over to Amazon and made my purchase. What, what, yeah, but did you do it for your model railroad stuff, Len? Yes. How did you know that? Very good. Yes. It's hard to find stuff that you're buying from other collectors. That's a nice spot. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, that's exactly what I use it for. Yeah. And by nice spot, I mean incredibly dangerous. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. Next is you still need to save. I like this one, OG. You know, just because you have a balanced budget doesn't mean you're moving forward. Like I know a lot of people, they finally get their budget to balance. They high five themselves. We've had times, we had times, remember in the late nineties when the government balanced the budget and everybody in Washington was like, (laughs) finally for like six months made the budget work. All right. We need to go back for a second though, to this Reddit post. Cause that's the opposite of what this guy says. He literally says, save nothing until it's paid off. It doesn't make sense to save money when you have credit card debt growing exponentially in the opposite direction. And then he actually says to basically spend down everything in your checking account. And then says, if you run short on money in your checking, big whoop, dip into the credit card for 50 bucks, keep basically nothing in your bank account. So they completely flip this around. This is why you should totally always get your financial advice from Reddit. <laughs> Absolutely. This is like really solid advice here. Great. Uh, Reddit, we love you, by the way. But I actually want to talk about the difference in that. Where do you guys sit on that? Because I remember our old contributor, Greg McFarlane, was all about what what he's talking about here, about, hey, go back to the credit card for a month or two. I've seen that go horribly wrong for people, like horribly wrong. Chelsea, you're nodding your head. I think it's just an emotional thing, right? Like you're trying, you're doing everything you can to bring that balance down. And then all of a sudden you got to bring it back up again. And it's like, it's so easy to go to what's the point when you do that, right? I'm a huge proponent of having some kind of small cushion so that you don't have to dip back into the cards. I do know some people though, and I don't advocate this, what the Reddit guy is saying. I don't, I don't advocate this at all, but I do think that for some people that emotional risk of, I got to make it work out because I have no other resource is the way they get the job done. Like OG and I used to know a guy back in the day that bought himself a super expensive car. This guy was a financial planner. Bought himself a super expensive car just because he knew he'd have to come up with the money to make the payment every month. And so it forced him to work harder. I love the look at Chelsea's face. Like, what? how does this work? <laughs> like, like, buy the super expensive thing first. And then go figure out how to do it. Go figure out yeah. how to afford it before it gets repoed. Yeah. It gives me anxiety just even hearing about it. Is that not a good idea? Yeah, it's anxiety inducing, but I've seen people do it that way. And that sounds like what the Reddit guy's saying. He's like, listen, just just spend every penny and then make your brain go. There is something to be said Burn though. The what yes, I was gonna say, OG, there's something to be said for if you have no other resource, you don't have an emergency fund, your brain comes up with other ways to handle the problem. So I was just talking to somebody who was in a car accident. They uh, got the value of their car because it was totaled. And uh, they're trying to decide how to get the new car, right? So the car's worth 8,000 bucks. They got an $8,000 check and they're, you know, hey, should we put that down on the new car? Should we, should we buy a used? Should we buy an $8,000 car? You know, all these different choices. And one of the things that came up was, well, maybe I'll just put that money in a separate savings account and that money I'll use to make my car payment for the next couple of years. And, and I said, uh, I said, that is so slippery because that extra reserve for anything else in your life will turn into, yeah, I know it's, but it's Christmas. So just this once we're going to dip into the car pay down fund just, just, just now, or yeah, we spent a little bit too much on insert thing here. Well, just, just this one time. And all of a sudden the plan to have a car payment taken care of for the next two years, it's really now 15 months. And There's just too much of a comfortability with that versus taking the eight grand and going, I'm buying an $8,000 car or taking the eight grand and going, I'm buying a $30,000 car, but now I have a $22,000 loan or whatever the case is, like whatever works out best because there's no backup plan. It's like the same thing when it comes to the credit card piece, talking with people who say, well, I'm going to use this card for my normal expenses moving forward, you know, so I can have a, have a good handle on my expenses, but I really need to work on paying off that one. It's like, are you crazy? (laughs) Like I'm going to take this drug so that I don't take that drug anymore. (laughs) You know, it's like, 
no. How about no drugs for a while? Like you can take some eventually again. Like they're cool. Some. So just, you know, just don't take them any right now. Like you got to get through the, like the detox part. It's like your coffee addiction. It's like, I'm only going to have black coffee, Joe, not coffee with cream and sugar. So I can kick my cream and sugar black coffee habit. But you got to know yourself too, right? Like there's some people that slip back into needing to use, you know, they burn the boats and they look for a solution and their mind just can't do that. They go immediately to the world is over. And yeah. like, yeah. and yeah. then there's people who are like, I'm going to hustle until I figure it out. And you got to know what side of the coin you're on if you're going to actually burn the boats. Cause, but I've also known people that have burned the boats. And this is why financial planners will never go with the burn the boat strategy because of the fact that, that when you deal with the law of large numbers, and you see tons of people, there are people, even if they're emotionally ready to burn the boat, they burn the boat and then something really bad happens and then they're completely screwed. Len, which type of person are you? Burn the boats or keep the reserve? Uh, I keep the reserve. <laughs> that's yeah. just, that's me, Mr. S you know, I, I was just, you talking about the car thing. That same, that exact thing happened with my daughter who, she bought a new car. Other car was really acting up, but she got five thousand dollars for it. And the question was, well, do you put it towards the loan for her the the new used car that she bought and lower the payment, or does she take that money and put it to the side and save it for repairs and extra car payments when she's having a you know bad time earning money, she's just having a slow month? And uh, she actually went the other route. She took the five thousand dollars she got from the other car, and it's in a side account. So, and she uses that to pay the car payments when she's having a slow month earnings wise or, and she uses it as a reserve for uh, maintenance and she can handle it because unlike my son, she is a saver. She's got the same mindset as I do. So it, brother, it all comes down to how you are. My brother would be going on vacation. Immediately on vacation. Immediately. <laughs> yeah. For a $10,000 vacation. <laughs> it's amazing to see those traits in your kids. Mine are young and I can see them with the boys. Yeah, which one is the saver? Which one is the spender? It's amazing. Yeah. You wonder how they both come out of the same parents, you know? <laughs> you wonder, Len. My <laughs> oldest is three. <laughs> Scratch your head, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> My oldest is three. And when he was got his first haircut, he was two. And they had like they had a gumball machine. And the got, kids got like a, a fake dollar to put in the machine to get a prize after they got their haircut. And he did not want to spend his fake dollar. <laughs> and he's, he's standing there. He's like, no, I have to put it in my piggy bank. And I'm like, but it's not a real dollar. Like you, you can get a gumball. IRA, I don't I don't want one. <laughs> so, wow. So he's a saver. The other one's only 18 months, but he's wild. So I have a feeling that that's going to go the other way. My kids, my son is also a huge saver. You, you gave him an allowance and you never had any idea where it went. He always was broke and you knew he had the money. He would just still <laughs> ask you for money on top of that. You know, he's like, yeah, I know you just gave me X amount of money. I just had a birthday. I got all these presents, but can I get uh, something? My oldest is the one that we go to with the babysitter in the, on the stoop waiting to get paid. And we're like, Alex, we need some cash, dude. Uh, Hook mom and dad up. Uh, you got like sixty. Uh, call seventy. You got seventy. Borrow like, money from your. He's kid all like. Is he giving you long shark rates? All like twenty points, dad. <laughs> <laughs> the meter's running. You know what happens if you don't pay? He's got like a baseball bat that he's drumming in his hand. That's right. Kid comes out with a twenty-five page contract. Eighteen and a half percent. I don't know if you're good for it, Dad. What's your What's your social security number? Got to check your credit. Let me double check this real quick. Yeah, uh, we are way over time. But Chelsea, anything in the Reddit piece that you found really interesting? Because we're going off the market watch here. No, I think uh, I think we covered the funny things over here. Yeah, we should cut to the chase here with a big takeaway. We'll let our guest of honor go last. So, Len, uh, big takeaway: paying down this debt uh, quickly. What's the big aha here? It can be done. Where there's a will, there's a way, and uh, no debt is ever too big to not pay off. OG? I think just recognize that it's going to suck for an extended period of time, but the suckiness ends. Chelsea, you got the last word. That there's always a creative way to do it. I think the one thing that we did miss in the Reddit piece is that this guy was making skateboards by hand, like two to three a week to sell. His wife became a birth photographer of all things, and they like made it work, and that there's always a way to get out, and it's not going to be forever. In the middle of our Friday episodes, we stopped to talk about fintech. I'm a big fan of 
new technology in the financial area. And here's one. You know how you often get credit card rewards? Why wouldn't you, if you're just shopping online at your favorite places, just get points for that, right? If you can control your spending, we always say, you control your spending, why not use a, a cashback reward card or a, or a card that pays you points? Well, what if you're not using those cards? Well, a guy named David Nelson is the CEO of Bumped. You familiar with Bumped, Chelsea? I'm not. I am not either. And do you get points? Do you use a credit card to get points when you spend money? Yeah, I do. And then you pay them off every month? Every month. So remember, if you're paying stuff off every month, this is great. If you stay within your budget, this is great. This is obviously all horrible stuff for people that get excited about this that aren't. But today we're going to learn about Bump. Let's say hi to David Nelson coming down to the basement. And coming down the stairs to the basement from Bumped, it's our new friend, David. How are you, man? Very good. It's excellent to be here. Well, I, I didn't bump my head on it. I know. I know, especially that uh, it gets a little narrow there at the bottom of the stairs, but you made it successfully. But something, something else that's been uh, successful so far that I really was curious about is your brand. This is something I think completely new to a lot of our listeners. How did you come up with the idea for Bumped? Or did somebody else come up with the idea and you're along for the ride? Yeah, well, I think it's a combination of a couple folks coming off of the last company that I started, which brought the mobile gift card into the market so that we could all use our gift cards from our iPhones and Android devices I had actually invested in a a venture fund down in the Bay Area called Commerce Ventures. And via a conversation with a a good friend of mine, Dan Rosen at Commerce Ventures and myself, I think we uh, sort of struck upon this idea. And uh, once we did, I was all about going and doing it. Well, let's talk about exactly what the idea is. Uh, How does Bumped work, David? What happens is a consumer downloads a Bumped app. They choose the brands they're loyal to. So are you loyal in the home improvement category to, you know, is it Lowe's or Home Depot for you? When it comes to grocery, we have a lot of choices. Obviously, coffee, right? All of these different categories have opportunities for the consumer to choose which brands they're passionate about. Secondly, you you link your credit cards and debit cards into the app. And, and the reason we need that is so that we know to automate the process of rewarding you so that when we see that you went and shopped at a Target or a Walmart or what have you, we automate that process of then rewarding the consumer in the appropriate category. So once you've done those two things, choosing who you're loyal to and linking those cards, all you have to do is live your life and spend. And as you do, you start earning these fractional shares of stock. So for example, you spend $100 at somewhere like a Walmart, you get maybe a dollar back in stock and all of those dollars start adding up and build share positions in these companies that you're passionate about and that you shop at and the shopper becomes a shareholder. And I don't want this to go under the table. I want to stop here for a second because this is something that you kind of breeze by. I don't have to go to some place that I usually don't go. I just can continue living my life the way I live now. And I'm picking up rewards for things that I was going to do anyway. Yeah, I think that's the key. I think two things. Whenever you're dealing with rewards, you don't want to feel like you have to play hopscotch to get them. Consumers tend to get a little bit frustrated by that. I think the other thing is creating a reward that is meaningful is the other element of this that that I think got me very excited as opposed to it just being transactional in nature, this one-time reward where you get a coupon or cash back or something. You're actually building towards something, which is really exciting. Well, that's what I frankly like myself, David, is that, you know, I go to Target right now. I use the Target red card. I get some money back that I can then spend more money at Target or I get the, to your point, I get coupons or something, which I'm going to spend more and have more consumerism. This way I get equity. How does the idea of equity work, though? You know, grocery, I know the margins are pretty thin, which they might be a little bigger in other places. Are the rewards different depending on the place where I go? Yeah, for sure. I mean, as you look across the different categories, obviously all of those categories have their own macroeconomics involved, and therefore some of them are going to end up having higher margin than others. Also, as you look across different categories, some of them are brands that maybe you only spend at once every couple months, whereas other ones are brands you're going to spend multiple times per month. But all of them have this one consistent need, which is actually building a relationship with their customer. 
when do I cash out and actually get my shares when I get a full share or five full shares or do I get it as I go? Yeah, you get it as you go. I, again, I think that's a key not having to play hopscotch, right? Like the consumer doesn't want to feel like anybody is making things difficult on them. Otherwise, it's not as fun to participate in. So uh, in this case, uh, even if you were rewarded, you know, a nickel or 25 cents, if you really wanted to sell your very small share position in a company and turn it into cash, you can. Now, what we've seen is that consumers don't do that. In fact, I think people take a lot of pride and going and shopping at a store and being able to say, hey, that's that's my store. And so just because you've earned 15, 16, 17 dollars a stock in a particular retailer, uh, I don't think your first thought is, hey, I want to get this 16 dollars. And that is what this is about. It is about creating relationship between the brand and the consumer. In terms of you guys making money, like I get how I make money and I build equity in these companies. I know what's in it for the retailer and I get you making the match. How do you guys actually earn any money, David? We try to keep the economics very straightforward between the brand and the consumer as far as obviously the brand or associated bank you would want helping sponsor the cost of the reward. From our perspective, you know, we have an underlying broker dealer. It's called Bump Financial, wholly owned by the parent. And that broker dealer, um, which a lot of folks know as a brokerage, is really kind of what makes us unique. It allows us to hold all of these shares on behalf of the consumer. And what we're looking for the brands and our partners to do is help sponsor the cost of managing these brokerage accounts across Uh. our consumer base. And so we charge those brands or associated banks essentially a fee to help pay for the cost of the brokerage services. And, And in that way, there's never a cost to the consumer uh, even if they are selling a dollar, two dollars of stock, they never end up having any types of transactional fees to go sell their stock, uh, which is important because if you're selling two dollars of stock and you right. have to pay a fee to sell two dollars of stock, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? I was uh, thinking that, that that traditional eight dollar fee, I end up uh, selling my stock and I owe you six bucks. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So this is just all about creating something where you don't end up with uh, the miscellaneous fees to the consumer. The product is called Bump. Now, is it app-based? Is it web-based? How does it work technologically? Yeah. So the consumer downloads an app. You can download off of Android or iPhone presently. At some point, we'll launch a service that gives access through web and mobile in that in those regards. But right now, it's Android and iPhone. And you just download the app and get on the wait list, and then you go for it once you get your invite. That was my next question. You guys are wait list now. Uh, when do you expect to launch? Certainly, it's our goal to come off of having a wait list as soon as we're able to. I think we have this really interesting element of what we're doing. Of we're trying to put a bunch of brands together so that we create great value for our consumers. And so one of the great elements to holding things in pilot for a period of time is it allows us to aggregate all of these brands and put them together so that when we bring everybody on board, we sort of have all of the pieces put together. And so look for that to happen at some point over the course of the next year. Uh, Approximately how many brands right now, David, are you working with? Right now, you'll see roughly 30 brands in the app. And that's something that we continue to grow. And coming back to that, you know, the last thing I just spoke about is, um, you know, part of it is creating that value by putting enough brands into the app. There's also an element of understanding our consumers and the data so that we do a good job of taking care of our customer. That's one of the things we've really been focused on is creating that great experience so that as we launch this to millions of consumers, we really have the app, customer support, and all of the other elements dialed. This isn't something that anybody else has gone and done before. And so recognizing that, we we just know that we really have to make sure we have all of our support functions put in place. Makes sense. It it also seems to me that if somebody gets in here in the next few weeks or a bunch of listeners get in the next few weeks, they're going to want to stop by, I mean, periodically to make sure they sign up for other brands as you add new ones. That's right. And we'll do a good job of getting emails out, notifying people when they have more brands to select from and new categories and so forth. But absolutely. I know that uh, you guys aren't sitting still. I mean, obviously, you're adding brands and you're trying to get through this launch as easily as possible. But what's after this? Have you guys thought about once the platform's up and running, David, what you guys are going to peel off next? You know, if you come back to our original thesis, this really is about making consumers have this incredible opportunity to know what it feels like to be an owner. 
It's about giving more people access to the stock market. You know, it's an incredible stat, but what is it? 60% of people can't afford a $500 emergency or a $1,000 emergency. You know, as you look at some of the statistics out there, actually, I think it was 40% for a 500 and 60% for $500. You look at a statistic like that, you realize that consumers, you know, they're really not able to go invest, plunk down money and invest in the stock market. Now, the problem with that is it means a large swath of the U.S. market really does not end up exposing themselves to the things they need to be doing to prepare themselves downstream, right? When they're offered a 401k, they potentially say no. When they do actually have the capital to invest, they don't because they haven't been leading up to that. And so I think that's the thing that gets us really excited. If you look at the core thesis of what we're doing, it's giving access. It's making everybody educated and and aware. So if you look at downstream, to answer your question, if you look at downstream things that we end up doing within the app, they're all going to follow that thesis, which is how do you create access? How do you create opportunity? How do you build relationship between brands and consumers? You know, throwing it back the other direction towards the brands, you know, I think that we're a society now that doesn't pay as much attention to where we buy something, right? If we can get something for $2 less, we just go buy it for $2 less. I think the problem with that is we can't be ignorant of great institutions that we want to exist in our future because they bring a lot of other benefits and merits that really are important. So I think it's just making both the consumer and the brand more aware of relationship. um, And all of our products are going to follow that thesis. Very exciting stuff, David. Uh, The brand is called Bumped. And you know what? If you're walking the dog or you're on your commute, we've got you covered. We've got all of David's links on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. David Nelson, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes and explaining Bumped. I had a great time. Thank you for having me. Hey there, money nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to the best part of the show, my trivia. Well, you know what? There's been some tough trivia questions lately, so why don't we tone it down a few notches and throw you something easy this time. Here's the question. What's the average... Wait, what? Oh, sh**. Chelsea Brennan's here? I almost forgot. Okay, all right. We got to tile this one up, folks. We're taking this one to the top. Here we go. According to my trivia database, the first U.S. parking meter was installed in Oklahoma City on today's date back in 1935. So let's just spin this one a little bit. Let's see how Ms. Brennan likes this one supersized. How much revenue did not Oklahoma City, but nope, how much revenue did New York City receive from parking tickets in 2015. I'll have your answer right after this. I love how Chelsea's such a guest of honor here that uh, Doug even feels compelled to make the trivia that much more obscure. Congratulations, by the way, to Oklahoma City for starting something everybody loves, the parking meter. That's an exciting moment, Len. Have you gotten a parking ticket, Len? Yes. As a matter of fact, I have been towed. My car was towed. I was late for a final exam. This was way back when. And so it was pouring rain in the parking lot. The nearest parking spot was way out there in the boonies. So I decided I'd park in the red zone right in front of the the classroom. And I parked, pouring rain, went in, took my test, came out, and my car was gone. Well, stupid me, I thought the car was stolen. So I went to the campus police department, reported the car stolen, and the cop there just looked at me and shook his head and I gave him the license number. He goes, hey, you idiot. You parked in a red zone. They towed the car away. Anyway, so by the time I was all done, the ticket was like 40 bucks. And then the storage fee and the and whatever else it was. And oh, and they ruined my muffler when they towed the car. It was ridiculous. Yes. And ridiculous. They didn't pay for any of that. You had to pay. No, they did not. Imagine all that. New York City, how much money did they receive in parking tickets? Before we go into our answers. Let's give you the score of the shindig. Len last time miraculously nailed it, hit the answer right on the head and went ahead eight. He has eight. OG stuck with six. He's in a long drought. And Paula came on to tie him a few weeks ago with six. So Chelsea's playing on behalf of Paula. OG, you get to go first. Do you, would you like to guess first in the middle or last? Last. Who knew? Chelsea, would you like to go in the middle or first? In the middle. 
Huh, that's strange too. I'll go last. <laughs> <laughs> this depends on New York City parking tickets. What are you thinking? Oh my gosh. Let me tell you, I don't know, because I know I'm going to get Chelsea Brennan here anyway. <laughs> so does it really matter? Let's pick a nice round note. I really have no freaking clue again. This is so obscure. I'm going to say $100 million and dollars and five cents. One hundred million and five cents. Chelsea. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go higher than that. I'm gonna go which I know is the opposite, but I'm gonna go with uh two twenty five million. Why are you thinking it's higher than a hundred million? <laughs> so we actually I used to coach a hockey kid whose dad owned a company called Laz Parking. It's the largest parking uh in the oh, <laughs> In the in the country, amazing. Turns out I was a finger maid once. <laughs> <laughs> Several years ago, he got a contract to privatize all the parking in Chicago, and that was a billion dollar deal. So I'm willing oh. to bet this is an expensive thing. This is a profitable thing for New York City. Oh, <laughs> which totally could be completely made up. That's right. That could be. I could say a dollar. That would be. <laughs> That would be the Chelsea Brennan we expected to show up if he made up that entire story. <laughs> entire story, just to throw everybody <laughs> out. To make OG go go high. So what year are we talking about? 2015. Oh, recently. How much money did they make in parking fees? New York City. I was also going to say a high number before she told that story. But then I was thinking, if she said like $101 million, then I would say a dollar. Or 102 million, 225. Screw it. I don't know. 226 million. <laughs> Sorry. 225 million and one dollar. <laughs> Wait. Did Chelsea Brennan just get Chelsea Brennan? Yes. She she did. 225 and a dollar. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. No, wait a minute. Oh, 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 one. There it is. Yes. Bam. Wouldn't it be great if it was 225 million and 46 cents? be amazing no, it would not be amazing. <laughs> you gave her 99 cents room there dude well like any self-respecting podcast we're going to uh, make you wait for the answer so how about that bonjour welcome to french made easy with me your host mathilde today i'm joined by certified financial planner Devin carroll and together we will share a popular and simple french phrase so you too can use it in your own life sound easy sure Today's phrase is valuable when you see a woman named Sally. Say this. Sally, can I store my gold in your doomsday bunker? In French, you would say this popular phrase just like this. Sally, est-ce que je peux ranger mon or dans ton bunker anti fin du monde? Once again. Sally, est-ce que je peux ranger mon or dans ton bunker anti fin du monde? Now, let's hear certified financial planner Devin Carroll try it. Ready, Devin? Okay, yes. Sally, est-ce que de ranger mon dans ton bunker en ta fin du monde? Oh yeah, I nailed that for sure. Perfect. See how we sound almost exactly alike? You two can speak French easily and comfortably listening to Stacking Benjamins. See you next time. Au revoir. All right, uh, Len, you're first with 100 million. You're looking like the low guy in the totem pole. What do you think? But you got you you got 125 million of leeway there. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling really good because I, you know, when I saw Chelsea was on the uh, on the guest list today, I was uh, I already knew it was I was I was a, a loser. I was already but, in uh, your head. <laughs> but no, so Chelsea, thank you very much for giving me this breathing room. Chelsea, if it's 225 on the dot, you and Paula going home with a big win. How do you feel about that? I'd be shocked. I would be too, but that would be awesome. Oh, gee, more than 225 million? No idea. Well, Doug, what's it going to be? Welcome back from the break, trivia fans. Have you been sitting in that same spot during this segment? Well, you better take a few laps around the house before Joe's mom comes back because she's been giving out tickets for what she calls lazing around. I don't remember that law, but hey, you know, it's her basement. So while Joe's mom lets you try her new fruitcake recipe in lieu of a fine, New York City residents don't have that luxury. 
Before the break, I asked you this question. How much revenue did New York City receive from parking tickets in 2015? The answer? If you said $565 million, you'd be correct. Uh, no one tell Joe's mom how much cash she's missing out on, all right? I mean, let's just keep that between us. I think she's coming down now. I gotta go. See ya! Wow. That is a lot of parking tickets. That is a lot. I'm surprised, Chelsea. After So that story was was absolutely true that you told. Absolutely true. And it actually is super frustrating because I got to say like 80% of the time I go to park in a parking garage or something, it's Laz Parking, which is Al's business. And I'm just like, really, I couldn't get some kind of deal here to not pay you every single time I have to park my car. Man, what's, <laughs> what's 1% of 500 million? That's uh, not too bad. At least $5. At least. That's a good business to be in. I mean, Chelsea, that's like passive income. So this is, I'll tell the quick version, but he uh, actually dropped out of college during his, after his uh, freshman year at UConn, he was looking for something to do uh, for summer job and went to a nice restaurant in Hartford, which there's not many of, and said like, hey, you don't have any parking. What if I do your valet parking for you? Um, And by the end of the summer, he had six restaurants he was doing this for and quit school, decided to just keep growing that business. And now he is the largest parking across the country. He makes literally billions uh, just running parking garages. I remember a story, I think it was in Detroit, where kind of the same parking guy was at the, uh, you know, they have all those city parking places that you park at, you know, day parking or whatever. Sure. Chicago has them, whatever is eight bucks a day or something. And, and same old guy worked at the same booth for 40 years and everybody knew Bill or whatever his name was. And every day he would, uh, you know, you'd come in, you'd give him your money and, you know, you'd park your car. And one day Bill wasn't there and people started worrying about him and missed a day of work ever. And so people started asking around and, you know, where, what, what happened to him? And there's an older guy. And, and so somebody finally went down to the city hall and said, you know, who, wh- wh- where's the guy that you had running the parking, you know, at that lot? And the, <laughs> the city goes, yeah, we don't own that lot. And they said, well, who's been taking our, you know, the, the guy's been taking our money. They're like, yeah, we don't have an employee by that name. It was just some guy <laughs> who stood out there for 40 years, just collecting $5 bills from people to park their car. And finally, he just had accumulated enough $5 bills that he didn't have to stand outside anymore. He said, I'm out. <laughs> and that was that. That is it so... It wasn't even his lot. It wasn't, it was just, he just stood out there and found out people would pay him money to, put their car in that little square concrete area over there so that's awesome <laughs> that's like the guy remember the guy? wait were people leaving their keys with this guy no like, no, no no it was like you know like a you know like a city parking thing that's owned by but it's not city owned and you know it might be the back of a building that you'd park for a concert or something it says ten dollar parking type of thing. same type of deal only just imagine that somebody just stood there and gave you a ticket every day and you'd pull in and <laughs> you know give Peter five bucks and eight bucks or whatever. It was like a low, you know, he was like the low man on the block. So he just always had a full parking lot and he could afford to charge less. His overhead was <laughs> zero, no taxes. He just <laughs> vanished. That is fantastic. That's like that story we ran a few years ago where that guy, uh, that guy was working, I think as an engineer, and he realized that he, with the money he was making, he could outsource his job to India or China <laughs> for, right. for like half the money. So he paid somebody in China to do all his work for him. <laughs> 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 half of what he's being paid. <laughs> Performance reviews had to be fun on that one. That was great. We really like the work you did on the Johnson case. <laughs> oh yeah, that was a that was a really amazing one. Remind me again, which then that was. I'm so engrossed in so many of these things. It's hard for me to yeah. keep track. Hey, let's take out the magnifying glass, guys, and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. Because when you go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you know what you find, Chelsea? What? You find that they're financial products <laughs> every day. That was good. Uh, they're nowhere near best in class. Over 92% of the products available online are all raked at magnify money. She's like, I have no idea. We're on the show four times, Glenn. Four times. Still has no idea. <laughs> yeah, some people are slow learners. I guess so. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money to check it out for yourself, Chelsea. And uh, today, <laughs> we're going to throw out the lifeline to our friend Tyson. Say hi, Tyson. Hi, Joe and OG. 
This is Tyson from Alaska. I'm a longtime stalker, first time caller. I appreciate your sponsors. That's not my question. My 401k with my current employer fee averages to about 1.3% of my holdings annually. The mutual fund options are not bad, but I am wondering if I could be saving money on fees. Can I be rolling this over to a Roth IRA? Thanks in advance. Oh, and I promise not to listen to your advice unless I do. <laughs> unless I do. <laughs> I promise not to listen, but I might listen. He's got his fingers crossed behind his back. That's right. Uh, Chelsea, what do you think? 1.3% on fees in his 401k. What do you, what does he do? Uh, so I think the first thing is like, make sure you understand how your match vests and that you're not moving money around. Uh, that's not that you're somehow going to break policy. But if you're going to do a Roth conversion, you got to stop in a traditional IRA first. Uh, and then remember, they got to pay taxes there. I actually used to roll every year out of our company's 401k for the same reason, uh, inter- in just into a traditional IRA, but it dropped my fees from like 1.2 to less than 0.1%. So worth it if you can do it, uh, especially if you can do a direct transfer and not worry about taxes. Your company, though, has to allow you to do that. Yeah. So you got to make sure you can do an in-service transfer. Yeah. Ask your HR people, Tyson, if you can first. Don't just go. Don't just go, uh, hey, I'm rolling my money out. Yeah, you, you might not be able to. Len, uh, Len, do you like that move? Certainly. I don't know what his what his fee, what did he say his fee was? 1.3, 1. 1. I think he said. Oh, 1.3. Yeah, that seems kind of high to me for a 401k. I don't know. I, I thought the average was closer to one, something like that. So yeah, that seems kind of high. But you know, if it's like, my, like where I work, I couldn't do that. You know, my 401k, I'm stuck. So I don't have that option. So, but yeah, I think it's worth going off and exploring. Sure. But I think that for you though, Len, then exploring what your fees are and making sure that you're not overpaying for non-performance is still pretty important, right? Yeah. And I don't know about how all these different companies work differently or what, but you know, whenever I make a change, like I rebalance, if I rebalance and then within 30 days I say, oh, wait a minute, I want to rebalance something different again. I get penalized. Yeah. I get charged another like one. I think it's more than one. I think it's one and a half percent just because I did something within 30 days. So I have to be careful not to rebalance more than once every 30 days because, you know, I used to, and I know a lot of people did. I use my 401k. I balance, I changed that thing around. I was like day trading my 401k for a while. Which is but, why they now charge people. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to do that. I used to do it like on every other week. I'd be re in you know, fine tuning my 401k. Just like on the trivia where we call going $1 higher, Chelsea Brennaning them. In 401ks, they call rebalancing every 45 minutes, Len Penzoing it. Yeah. <laughs> I swear, I, I used to day trade my 401k. <laughs> it's just, that is not advice. <laughs> it's not advice. Gold prices don't move that fast. <laughs> <laughs> He's these day trading gold, nickel, silver, <laughs> palladium, yeah, all those. Uh, OG, any any thoughts? Well, I would say uh, if you have the option to do it, it's a great idea to do the in-service withdrawal. Most times, though, I would say probably ninety-nine percent of companies do not allow this until you reach over fifty-nine and a half. At least my observation. But you may have a better outcome if you try to approach HR and just talk to them about the issue. This type of business is very competitive. And if the company that manages the 401k right now finds out that you're kind of kicking the tires or HR is kicking the tires of another place, they're quick to find a meaningful restitution to keep the business. And quite often that manifests itself in lower cost products. You may also have lower cost products within the plan that you're not utilizing. So you got to go through each option and see what it is. But if you're able to do it, it's a great idea. If you can't and you still want to do the Roth component of it, why not just do a Roth 401k instead, which is the same outcome. It doesn't it doesn't count for your existing money, of course, but moving forward, at least you can start building that tax diversification. So you might be able to do the Roth contributions into the 401k, even if you can't do the uh, the distribution out and convert it. But you might get some movement from HR, especially if a couple of people complain about it. Yeah, I think if you have a group of people go to HR at once. That's... All at the same time, like pickets, <laughs> and like fire torches, like a Simpsons movie. Just plaster stuff on their office door. Yeah. That's perfect. And do it after hours. Like a sit out. Like, we're not working until our 401ks are, fees are lowered. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
what, what's going on with all the people in the lobby? Yeah, something about fees or something? I don't know. But fix it, damn it. They're losing money. Can you see people come come home from work one day? Hell no. We won't go. Hell no. We won't go. Hey, I got good news and bad news. <laughs> we can lower our 40k fee. The bad news is I'm not going to work anymore. <laughs> I'm now a blogger. <laughs> no offense to the bloggers in the room. <laughs> the good news is I got all that time to blog now. <laughs> About how to lower your 401k fee. Right, side right. hustle is no longer a side. That's it's right. a main hustle. Right. Very first blog post. Ways not to complain about your 401k. <laughs> yeah. Sliding the letter <laughs> under the door like an office space. But I do like that idea. Seriously, though, if you know, if you've got a group of five of you that walk to HR and go, hey, we, can we? Yeah. WTF. I mean, it, don't be confrontational. Be supportive. Listen, say, I'm hey. telling you, the way this business works, there is a bajillion, and that is a technical term, fund choices that the 401k provider can put in there. That's almost limitless. And if you raise enough stink, the 401k provider will go, oh, okay, uh, how about these 20 choices instead? And then, you know, I mean, they make money on the spread. So if you, like I said, if you think that you have enough oomph to move that or they, the 401k record keeper feels like or provider feels like they're going to lose that business, magically they'll manifest a whole bunch of new options. It'll be, it'll be amazing. Are those fiduciary meetings about the 401k, like the companies are required to have, are those open? Like, can you sit in those? I doubt at, it. At companies? Probably yeah, not. I doubt it. Yeah. I don't even think they happen. <laughs> <laughs> that, sadly, I think that's true. Way too often. People are like, Arissa, what's that? Uh, thanks for the question, Tyson. You got a question for the show? Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And uh sounds like we're sending a Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt to Alaska, OG. How about that? We're not paying extra postage. We're, we're, we're not, Tyson. So you may or may not. Get Might as well be Russia. <laughs> I could see Russia from my backyard. <laughs> oh, don't geez. you remember that from? Uh, I do remember that from a past election. Yeah. Yes, I do. I remember Tina Fey too <laughs> doing that bit. That's who did it, right? It wasn't Tina Fey who said that? Tina Fey, Sarah Palin, and you have now done that bit. Oh, okay. Yes. Let's. One of us did it better. I th- I think on that note, it's probably time for us to go. Uh, Chelsea, thanks a ton for hanging out with us. We're going to talk to you last about what's going on where you live. But let's start off first with Mr. Penzo, because um, I think you've got some very important stuff going on at LenPenzo.com we need to talk about. Uh, I did a paper towel test. So uh, the results of that scientific survey, which paper towel is your best value? And boy, did I go to a lot of trouble for this. So please come by my blog, The Persistent Itch. And you will see, you will find out for yourself, is Viva really the best paper towel? Or maybe it's Bounty. Or maybe it's something else. I saw this on the front of the National Enquirer. You did? This was bigger than Taylor Swift's Alien Baby. That was below. (laughs) Which paper towel is best? Like you do all the top headlines. Hey, I, you know what? I know there's a lot of men and women out there who are just dying to know. I mean, I'm sure you got, you've been using your paper towels going, is this really the I thing could be more absorbent? I know I'm missing out. Somebody, there's a better paper towel for my buck. And I went and did the work. When you say you, you did all the work, you went through a lot of trouble. You just mean you spilled a bunch of shit, don't you? No, no. Like, for example, I did a strength test. I did an absorbency test. I mean, this is scientific. Look, I'm an engineer. I did this. This is an engineering test. <laughs> so this is very scientific. We switched to cloth paper towels like a year ago. So <laughs> they're very strong. That's an oxymoron. I know. But Len, anyway, don't let the distractors stop you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't. Strength test, absorbency <laughs> test. What else? Well, you have to come by and see. I'm not going to give all my secrets away. That's nice. I like that. OG, what do you got going on this weekend? I think Len has taken the long tail keyword court (laughs) (laughs) from his blogging course that he took 22 years ago. Nobody's talking paper towels. Yeah. I did my search on, what was that, uh, Market Samurai? And there's... uh, (laughs) I can, I can rank number one on paper towel absorption. <laughs> I would just need my 500 words about it. Oh, gosh. Uh, what are we doing? So we are uh, on the road this weekend. Yep. T- time to head back from the Great White North down 
south, back to the Hacienda. Back to the Hacienda. Chelsea, thanks for hanging out with us again. It's always, it's a circus usually, but when Chelsea comes on, it's even more so. Thanks for having me. It's been great to be back. Tell me what Smart Money Mamas are up to. So we are actually working on a longer term project. We are going to be hosting our first virtual summit in October with over 40 female speakers, mostly moms, talking about everything from family finance to teaching kids about money uh, over five days. So we are we're working on that. We're just starting to record sessions now, actually. Oh, that's awesome. Cool. So that'll be coming out soon. October. So still a couple months. Nice. So you got time to go there, check out the site, get comfortable with the community. And uh, we'll, we'll have the link to smartmoneymamas.com if you're walking the dog or on your commute in our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Just one quick question first. If all of these women are in one place and they're talking, is there room for a paper towel expert? (laughs) I think absolutely our one male speaker should be there to talk about the optimum paper towel. I think think if there's room for one guy, it should be about paper towels. Absolutely. Yes. It's a persistent question. And I identify as a mother. And and as a matter of fact, people have called me being a mother. So I guess I, I will qualify for being there. Len, I get 10% of that fee. It, <laughs> I just arranged for you. All right. Don't spend it all in one place. On that note, I think this episode's done. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, here's what everybody should have learned today. First, take some advice from our roundtable team. Hoping to pay down some debt later? Yeah. <laughs> That's not a thing. Create a plan to pay it down now and don't spend money you don't have. Second, those places you shop, owning a little piece of the action can help people begin to understand stocks by dipping your little toe into the water. But the big lesson, don't tell Chelsea Brennan that you're going to sit in the big chair in the basement. That woman will find a chair slightly bigger and sit right in front of you. I got your game, Chelsea. I get it. I'm on to you. Special thanks to Chelsea Brennan for making another roundtable appearance. You can find more from Chelsea at her site, smartmoneymamas.com. Thanks to David Nelson from Bumped for joining us. You'll find the wait list for Bumped at bumped.com. Len Penzo, the captain of skepticism, appears courtesy of lenpenzo.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at @sbenjaminscast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. And special thanks to Dave Ramsey for dropping by the basement. Unfortunately, Dave, we weren't able to get you on the mic this episode, but hopefully soon. Stick around. Throwing shade at the birth photographers. I'm sorry. Oh, like, man. I, you know, Dang. who wants to be in somebody else's <laughs> delivery room? He actually meant like not the actual birth, but maybe like the newborn. Oh, no, the actual birth. This is Are like a thing. You can hire people who really. Will, I don't know why you would, but that's like wow. watch the baby crown <laughs> <laughs> and hold, hold, mom, hold. There we go. Let me get more light. A little more light. A little more light over here. And 
I think we got it. Okay, a little bit more, a little bit more. Whoa, 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 oh, too much. I didn't get the shot. I know the way Cheryl got frustrated with me. I can imagine with the birth photographer, get the hell out of here, <laughs> which would have been deserved. I told the story before, but but it took forever for our kids to be born. So I went down to the cafeteria. What was she thinking? I never took any of that stuff off. And, and, and I came back in the They're room. They're like, doctor? Nobody even noticed. Because we were having twins, we were in like this special operating spot right over there in case there was a problem because you know twin supposedly high risk pregnancy so i come back and i decided you to get like a, half a cheeseburger like hey oh guys, no 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 no. no 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 tuna fish sandwich obviously i had a tuna fish sandwich in a cafeteria at a hospital and then i'm leaning over her and i'm telling her to push your choices of She's like, what the food is unbelievable she's like what the, what the, she's like is that has she let you live this down yet because <laughs> She still talks about I'm telling her to push. Push. <laughs> <laughs> Tuna fish sandwich. I had a sandwich. So oh, did you wash it down with a big cup of coffee? <laughs> <laughs> coffee and tuna fish bread. As long as that tuna yeah. fish sandwich came out of a vending machine, you're okay. Yeah. All the choices had to get <laughs> Let's see here. Cheese pizza. No. Chicken sandwich. Oh, tuna fish. Yes. 